Hello, hello, hello. I'm a night owl. So I'm trying this Facebook Live thing again. Um, and hopefully, I know there's some people awake somewhere um, on the East Coast. Maybe. Yeah, um, I live the other night when I was introducing my paparazzi business. I almost felt like people were getting on Facebook expecting me to preach. Um, so I'm hopefully not going to preach, um, but I am going to do a little teaching. Um, and I have been meaning to do a Facebook live for a while. Hi, Auntie Tony. Hi, Mark. Um, thank you guys for joining. Please share. Um, hopefully, I will not be be before you long, as the old school preachers say. <laughs> but I am long winded, and so we'll see what happens. Um, and just for promos, I am wearing some paparazzi jewelry, <laughs> so I'll do a little fun plug there. Um, thank you for the hearts, love the hearts. Um, so I think I'll wait a little bit longer. Let's see if we can get some more people on but shout out where you're watching from and please share hi mark <laughs> tell your wife i said hi um i think you, you just had a birthday didn't you happy birthday <laughs> um but yeah shout out where you're watching from and let go let the other people know where you're tuning in from since this is like my first official facebook live um, not selling jewelry, <laughs> uh, officially anyway, um, although you can certainly hop on over to my paparazzi store, Desiree's paparazzi store, uh, dot com. And thank you for joining. Hey, Myrie. Um, hey, Calvin. Thank you guys for joining. Um, I think we can get started. Um, so I don't know if y'all can see the title, um, but my title is Pick a Side. First of all, can y'all hear the, my music in the background? Is it bothering you? Um, okay, yes, Mark, you did have a birthday. Okay, we got Kelvin watching from Rancho Cucamonga. I know where that is because I used to live in Cali. Hey, Kelvin. Um, I know Mark's watching from somewhere in Iowa because um, we used to go to the same church growing up <laughs> in Iowa. Um, so, okay, well, tonight we're going to be discussing Pick a Side. Um, and some of y'all maybe saw my post, um, I think it was a tweet um, that went onto my Facebook, um, and it was like, you know, if you're a singer, believer, aside. Um, okay, Mark, you're watching from Ames. That's not far from Des Moines, Iowa. Um, yeah, pick a side. And I'm going to try to not get too distracted. I do have notes. I came ready. I came ready. Please share. Um, there have been a lot of things that have been happening in the body of Christ um, amongst the leadership and amongst the lay people. It's completely unacceptable because from Genesis to Revelation, we are called to a standard. And more importantly, we are called to be the standard. We're called to to follow the standard and to set the standard. And nowhere from Genesis to Revelation is that standard to be dictated to the church by the world. Nowhere in scripture can you find it. I'm huge on scripture. Um, that's something people usually say when they see a lot of my blog posts. Oh my gosh, I'm not used to seeing so much scripture. I know one guy in Austria um, found me through one of my Jezebel posts um, a few years ago, and he was like, you've put more scripture into one of these blog posts than I hear in a whole sermon in Austria, which is sad. Um, very, very sad, but that's the case in a lot of our churches, you know, in America today. We tell nice stories, we give people warm fuzz. We don't, we're not very heavy on scripture, and that's a problem um, because the scripture is our foundation. It's our rock. You know, uh, the word was made flesh according to 14. So if we don't know the word, how do we dare call ourselves believers? What sense does that make? If you guys are coming on, welcome, welcome, welcome. I see some of my students on here from Kairos Ministerial Institute. 
big props. Hope you did your homework. <laughs> um, but please share this. Please share this. And if I forget to say it, keep sharing this throughout. Um, but we need to understand scripture. If we don't have scripture, what do we have? You know, um, there is some person who <laughs> recently commented on one of my YouTube videos and they were like, you're so heavy on scripture. You focus on scripture. And basically they were coming at me because I actually adhere to the word of God because I share the word of God because I, uh, measure my life by the word of God. And they're saying you should be all about the spirit. Well, no, 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 no. We need the spirit. You know, we need the logos and the rhema. <laughs> we need both sides. Um, R.T. Kendall has um, in his um, devotional, which is fabulous, 40 Days with the Holy Spirit, which goes with his Holy Fire book. Um, he's talking about how there's been a silent divorce in the church between the word and the spirit. We have very word heavy denominations and fellowships. And then we have very spirit heavy denominations and fellowships. Well, you're, you're missing something. If you're on one side, we need both. We need both. We need the word and we need the spirit because if you're just chasing after the supernatural, you're a mystic. I have a, um, a chapter on this <laughs> in my book, The Days of Noah and Lot. We don't need mystics. We don't need cuckoo crazy people, cuckoo for cuckoo puffs. <laughs> like we don't need that in the church. We've already made ourselves look bad. We've already lost our influence because of the craziness we've done in the name of being led by the spirit of God. The devil is a liar. A lot of that stuff is just crazy, you know? And at the same time, we have people that are just heavy on the word and it's like their their Christianity is one of morality. Now we sh should and do have a standard of morality according to scripture, but Christianity is simply not a set of moral values. Christianity is a lifestyle. We are kingdom ambassadors as Miles Monroe said. It is a lifestyle and the word said the word itself says the kingdom is not in word but in power. Thing to back up what you are saying. If all you do is just have a nice life, well, there are atheists who have a wonderful life and who have you know high morals. So when you go to somebody like that, how do you differentiate yourself from someone who says, "Well, I don't need God." You know, I have my marriage in order. You know, my kids aren't crazy. Everything's, you know, my money's right. I don't steal. I don't lie. I don't cheat. I don't whatever. You know, how do you differentiate yourself? So we, we need word and power. We need that balance again because you can have a whole lot of power, but then you have to start scratching yourself and start wondering, okay, where? Because there are people who believe that if it's supernatural, then it's God and the devil is also a liar. <laughs> Everything that is supernatural is not God and everyone who is preaching the word is not doing it from the right place, is not doing it in the right spirit. A lot of people use it as a weapon. Now don't get it twisted. The word of God is indeed a sword. It is a double-edged sword. A lot of times in scripture and symbolism, the word equated to a sword or words in general are equated to swords knives daggers things that are sharp and we know that things that are sharp can be a tool or they can be a weapon we should be using it as a tour a tool in the spirit it is a weapon but it's not meant to cut people down it's not meant to cut people down and none of this was in my notes <laughs> but we we need to in the church we need to stop picking a side <laughs> and then the people who are on the fence need to pick a side you know, so there's a balance. There's a balance to everything. So this, this particular teaching is picking a side. And we're seeing so much mixing, so much syncretism. Well, I can still do this, but I can be a believer. And we have what I call this new Snoop Dogg Christianity. And <laughs> I haven't heard you make any profession of faith. I haven't heard you identify as a believer. I haven't seen an article. I haven't seen a video. I haven't seen anything you have made a public profession of your faith, but we're supposed to just relate to you as you're a believer? 
and it's not, I'm not, it's easy to pick on Snoop Dogg because Snoop Dogg just came out with a gospel album and he tried to come for the leaders in the church, which is entirely out of order again, because nowhere from Genesis to Revelation do you see the word of God stating that the church uh, is supposed to be dictated to standard wise by there's nowhere you find that in scripture. And what is shockingly amazing to me, and at the same time not amazing, is that so many people are like, yeah, Snoop Dogg better tell him. We got mega pastors and ministers and people who are supposed to know the word and be living the word who are like, yeah, tell him, Snoop Dogg. The devil is, in fact, a liar. When is Snoop Dogg the standard for the church? Why are gospel singers on Snoop Dogg's album? And then you have people say, well, if you're offended by this, then it wasn't for you anyway. That's not the issue. I have much less issue with Snoop Dogg's album than the, than the Christians who went on Snoop Dogg's album and prostituted their gift for a paycheck. For a paycheck. Because let's just be honest, it's business. If I bring a secular rap artist on my gospel worship album, it's about business. You can't pay me to tell me that that is about ministry. That is money. And we do know that money answers all things. So just be honest and just tell the truth. It's about money. This is not about ministry. But when, when did we get to the place where mixing was so acceptable? Jesus, and people will say, well, Jesus hung out with sinners. Jesus did not partake in the sin of the sinners. He influenced the sinners, and their lives were transformed because of his example and his standard. He did not allow himself to be influenced by the world. He did not pay the prostitutes or partake of their services without paying. <laughs> he did not, you know, dabble in embezzlement in stealing. He didn't fleece the flock. He didn't do what the tax collectors do. He didn't curse and whatever and sleep around and do all these things. He didn't do any of that. <laughs> he was not influenced by the world. And he told the people, you know, the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. How many of us can say that? I mean, that's you, that's me. Like, that's something we have to work toward. How many of us can truly say the ruler of this world has nothing in us? We are continually being perfected. This is not about condemnation. This is about recognizing where we are and where we need to be. Holiness is something that God is, and we are made in his image and his likeness in the spirit, you know, and we are meant representatives in the world in the earth so we should be representing him we should be living by that standard we should be presenting that standard not in a self-righteousness it, it, it cracks me up so much when people uh hear people promote the word of god and then they'll say well that's just she's just being self-righteous there is nothing about me that is righteous in and of myself. My righteousness is as filthy rags. You want to change that to modern terminology? That is a dirty, filthy tampon. Sorry, guys. <laughs> it's a dirty, filthy pad. If you want a dirty, filthy diaper, that is what a filthy rag is. And so that is what scripture equates our righteousness to. So there's nothing you can accomplish people over the head <laughs> if you're operating in your own self-righteousness I mean you're if you're operating in self-righteousness that's pride so just because someone is saying something that you don't want to hear does not mean that they're operating in self-righteousness and people love to shoot the messenger this is one of the things I taught my class last semester when we were studying dreams and visions of Bible symbols being a messenger we were talking about um, angels, and I'm not going to go super off on this. We were talking about angels and what angels look like and uh, angelic deceptions and things like that. And I said, okay, well, look look at the functions of the different angels in scriptures, because there's only one place in scripture that you see an angel that kind of maybe looks like a woman or a woman with wings, and that's Zechariah 5, 5 through 11. That's a whole debate, whatever. But I'm saying look at the function of the angels. What was Michael doing? He was a prince. He was a warring prince. What was Gabriel doing? 
He's a messenger. So if you're going through the heavenlies, if you're going through the second heavens where there is warfare, where Satan is the prince of the power of the airs, you're going to encounter warfare. <laughs> Being a messenger is not a peaceful job. If you look at the ancient world, whether it's from scripture, whether it's from history, whether it's from mythology, whatever, you see a messenger, that is not a safe job. People literally will shoot the messenger. They will take their arrows and they'll shoot, they'll shoot you. Modern day arrow, it's, it's, it's words. It's evil words. It doesn't have to be witchcraft, but it, but it could certainly equate to witchcraft. Um, Somebody saying, okay, somebody has a comment about Snoop Dogg. Okay, but being a messenger is not easy. So if being a Christian, being someone who speaks on behalf of God in whatever capacity, I'm not trying to give myself a title. Someone who is speaking the word of God. <laughs> that's not an easy thing. Now, it's easy if you're saying the nice parts of scripture that people want to hear. That's easy. Those are the parts that the world latches onto and works that into their new age and their religious humanism and their whatever Buddhism. That's those are the parts the world likes of the Bible where people will latch onto and say, Oh, well, well, we like Jesus. Jesus was a good teacher, he was a good prophet. But when you start getting to them parts of the word that people don't like, then they come for you. I posted a while back, you know, people love a pastor. You know, until you come for the corner of the pot that they're in. <laughs> Trust me, I've been doing this for a long time. I've been blogging uh, professionally since 2012. People love a pot stirrer or a whistleblower when you are talking about something that they agree with. But the moment you hit on something that they don't like, something they're struggling with, something they're in bondage to, they come for you. Let me tell you, it is the God's honest truth. And hello, I see a lot of familiar faces. Thank you so much. Please like and comment and share, invite people to be on this. Um, but yeah, people don't like a messenger that tells the truth. And so this reminds me, this is taking me back to my notes. Um, and so the opening scripture I want to share with you is one of my favorites, Galatians 1, 6 through 10. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you of Christ to a different gospel which is not another but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ a lot of y'all probably know where I'm gonna go with this but even if we or an angel from heaven so if Paul is telling us that if even an angel from heaven comes and preaches a false gospel that means it's possible for an angel to come from the heavens and preach a false gospel. The book of Revelation tells us that the angels are going to be proclaiming the gospel. So if a godly angel can do it, there is nothing to stop an ungodly angel from proclaiming a false gospel. So uh, verse 8, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, because out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is established. If anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. And then he answers it, answers the question that people are asking in their minds. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, then I would not be a bond servant of Christ. And so I, I, I absolutely love that passage. I love that passage. If you are truly prophetic, you love the word. Even if there are parts of it you don't understand, even if there are parts of it you don't like, parts of it that make you balk a little bit, you love the word. You prophesy out of the word. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus who became flesh, according to John. So we need to understand what the word says, and then we need to not be apologetic. Apologetics does not mean we're sorry for what we believe and we cower in a corner. It has a completely different meaning, and I'm not a Greek student, so find somebody else who is and ask them what that technically means, but that is not what it means, I assure you, because nowhere in Scripture do you see Jesus cowering. They tried to stone him. <laughs> That's how much they hated him. The world loved him. 
So there's a, there's a balance to the world loving you. That's a different topic. But it was the church folk who wanted to kill him. It was the religious leaders who wanted to kill him because they hated what he was saying. And this is making me jump ahead in my notes. But something I have in my notes, and I don't know who actually said this, but it's not my quote. But it says um, that God offends the mind to reveal the heart. Offense is a tool, people. Offense is a tool that God uses and allows uses and allows to reveal what is in your heart what's in your heart so if i offend you intentionally unintentionally whatever and the truth of uh, god's word is absolutely offensive to people who don't want to hear it it's extremely offensive and if you don't want to hear it you're gonna fight me you're gonna throw up the, the fingers and walk out of the service. You're not going to amen me. You're going to keep your offering. You're going to do whatever because you don't want to hear it. And a lot of people are going to come for you. And the loudest people who come for you are people who identify as believers. It's people who identify as believers. And because they don't want to be in the truth, they don't want to be in the truth, which is leading me um, I think to my next, uh, yes, my next um, verse, which is, and people love verse 16. They love John 3, 16, but they don't read the context. I tell this um, to my students. I, t I write this in my blog and in my books, and I'll tell you from a literary uh, writing standpoint, context is everything. So John 16 through 21 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his own son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be people might read verse 17 they'd be like okay cool Jesus isn't here to condemn us Jesus loves us well that's true and along with that there's verses 18 through 21 that says he who believes in him is not condemned but he who does not believe is condemned already. So he's not condemning you because you're already condemned. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and that men love darkness rather than their deeds are evil. They hate the light because light will expose you whatever is in the dark scriptural principle comes into the light and so they don't want their secret things and their dark places to be exposed for everyone practicing evil hates the light to the light lest his deeds should be exposed but he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in god so then why do we have this issue in the church? Why do we have this issue of people who don't want to hear truth? Why do we have that? It's going to make me jump ahead in my notes again. Um, I'm going to skip over my notes in Matthew uh, 3 and jump ahead to the parable of the wheat and tares, which is one of my main verses for this particular teaching. Okay, so we have um, at one section of Matthew 13, we have the parable, and then later on in the chapter, we have the interpretation. So the parable is Matthew 13, 24 through 30, and it says, Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while men slept, his enemy came sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain has sprouted and produced the crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you know good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us to then go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest and at the time of the harvest i will say to the reapers first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into my barn okay and then he gives the interpretation later which i may get to or may not um so 
what's so interesting, and I, <laughs> we do so many things by rote, and it's not that God doesn't necessarily reveal things to us, but we learn progressively. Pro Revelation is progressive that doesn't mean it goes outside of scripture it just means there are layers so something can be revealed to you in third grade then you'll have a bigger revelation on that same thing in 12th grade and then you may have another one in college you know so to speak just like we're, we're always learning and growing and there are layers to scripture gospel and become a believer and a phd you know a, a bona fide genius can also understand and grasp and be impressed by however you want to word it the scripture and be satisfied both be satisfied neither one of them be over uh in over their head or neither one of them be you know beneath their intellect whatever there are so many layers to scripture and so um at the same time though we don't always know because how many of us are actually farmers how many of us i mean maybe you'll have a better clue if you're a gardener but i think most of us on here are not farmers again if you're joining please like comment share uh into your timeline um but the a lot of people don't know the difference between the wheat and tares we know the tares are bad we know that tares are not a good thing and that apparently the enemy sows them here's the difference according to a um, farmer and I got this from Perry Stone I don't know the name of the farmers he got it from but I think he had some farmers who were some partners told him that tares look just like wheat or rather wheat looks just like tares here's the key until they mature so this is why we have so many believers who are indistinguishable from the world because they're not mature and this is really going to offend some people and that's fine i didn't come to offend you but i was prepared knowing that i would offend you <laughs> um but there are a lot of immature believers they are so immature offense and immaturity go together so if you're offended by your pastor telling you to put on something that's not skin tight by uh, your spiritual mother or your pastor's wife or whomever telling you to not have all your girls out in church if you're offended fellas <laughs> you know, I don't know if you are offended by biblical instruction by the by the word of truth then that's not you with the person who you think offended you it's your issue you and you have an issue ultimately at your root with God because you are not in truth operating truth you may have a little bit a little part of it but a little leaven leavens the whole lump <laughs> so we need to be in truth and guess what no one likes being offended and I, I like to distinguish an initial offense from actually operating in a spirit of offense because we all have offenses Jesus told us hey offenses are gonna come it's just, you know, that's just what it is. As long as you live in this life, you will have trouble. And I don't know those two verses don't necessarily go together, but you get the idea. You're going to be offended, whether you're driving down the street and somebody cuts you off, or whether your spouse says something crazy to you on an off day or because they're sleepy or because they're hungry, <laughs> because they're hangry, you know, whatever. It could be the, the biggest thing. It could be the littlest thing. We are going to be offended, period. Jesus was offended. He was offended several times over, I'm sure, especially. A lot of people probably thought he was um, an illegitimate child. Um, and so we're going to be offended. An offense in the sense like a temptation, if it comes to you, it's not a sin. But if you take it and you nurse it and you nurture it and you allow it to grow, then you are operating an offense. So again, you have an offense that comes to you, it can bounce off you. That's not a sin. An offense that's presented to you, not a sin. An offense you take and you welcome and you don't cast down because we're supposed to cast down everything, high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Fill in the blank as to what that is, you know. Um, we're supposed to cast those things down. So if you dwell on it instead, then you've come into agreement with it. So you're in an immature place. You know, little kids, get offended when their parents tell them they can't do something teenagers get offended and cop an attitude and talk back <laughs> if they don't know better you know when their parents tell them well you can't go out or you can't do this or you can't hang out with them or you can't date them whatever it's because they're immature 
Now, when you're older, then you understand, ooh, that, that was really a bad idea. That was a terrible guy to date. That stove actually was very hot. There were a lot of cars on that street, so I should not have run into it. When you're older, you can reason. You know, Paul talks about how when he was a child, he thought as a child. But when he was a man, he grew up and he put off childish things. This is something that we're not really focusing on in the church because we're so used to, you know, people giving us warm fuzzies. And Now, I love warm fuzzy movies. I will cry at the drop of a hat, y'all. It is true. I will cry at some of these little Facebook memes. I've cried at commercials before. I cry at country music videos and songs. I am a big fat crybaby when it comes to stuff like that. But we're not supposed to be ruled by our emotions. We're not supposed to be enthralled. Thrall is an old English Viking, whatever, however you want to word it, word for slavery. We're not supposed to be enthralled by our emotions. I heard somebody say, um, emotions are wonderful servants, but terrible taskmasters, something like that. Like we're not supposed to be ruled by our emotions. If we're ruled by our emotions, you know, you could be mature in every other area of your life, but that one thing, that one spot where you got offended, you you need to mature in that area. So I'm not even saying that like you can be immature across the board. A lot of people are, but there are all of us who are growing, and we don't always grow at the same place. God doesn't just like drop deliverance on us usually and just everything at the same time. Because could we really? Sometimes the answer is no. So he takes us through a process of deliverance, through layers of deliverance, where he deals with us. Okay, today we're going to deal with your love life. Today we're going to deal with your spiritual life. Today we're going to deal with your finances. Maybe we need to deal with your working out. Whatever it is, we have different areas of our life. And so we need to grow up in those different areas. And a lot of times when we have um, trauma, and this is sort of bridging off into a little bit uh, of something else, but it's relevant at the same time we have trauma in certain places, especially at shows and relationships, um, we can growth at that particular point. And so when you're arguing, let's say you're 36 years old, um, when your husband or your boyfriend, whatever is a girlfriend, depending on what gender you are, is uh, arguing with you. And suddenly they're just like, why did she just like go crazy or like smack me upside the head or whatever it's because there's some trauma that took place there and she has not grown in that place or if he cops a little attitude and is super passive aggressive starts acting crazy and just leaves the house you know he has an area that he has not, not matured in so when we get offended those are revealing the place need to grow you should be thankful maybe not necessarily to the person <laughs> but for God allowing you to go through the process so you can grow or so you can help somebody else but a lot of people don't want to be offended they will leave your church if you preach the wrong thing they will leave your fellowship group where they'll cut you off you know how many people have had to leave you on Facebook a lot of times they get really happy when that happens because it means there's just that much less stress in my timeline because people are just like well she said this or they misconstrue a context or whatever it is because they don't want to hear the truth and now and I'm gonna go there and I think this is what I'm kind of waiting for when I went live uh, the other night on Friday night this whole come Sunday Bishop Carlton Pearson business Okay, <laughs> I am astounded at the amount of believers who are applauding spiritual seduction of a man who used to be a mighty man of God. Now, I call him bishop to this day because I am grateful for the advances and the things he accomplished for the kingdom of God before. I respect him for what he did before. I honor him for what he did before. But you are seducing the masses. And let me tell you, and I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Thank you to all the people, Melissa, Markeith, uh, Elda Penland, Zanetta, um, my God bro, uh, Ben, thank you guys for joining. Please like and share. Okay, we are praising this crap. <laughs> we are praising the spiritual seduction of a man who himself has been spiritually seduced. He's not a charlatan. 
he really believes this. He really believes this. I heard part of his test testimony. Um, I forget who was with, I don't know if it was with Lexi or whatever, but he was being interviewed and he was talking about how he went through cancer and he had sort of a, an almost come to Jesus moment. And he was just like, God, if I have really and truly been leading these people astray, just, just let me die. Let me die. Obviously he's still alive and doing well from a health standpoint, as far as we know. And so that was a false confirmation to him that I am not on the wrong path. I am on the path of enlightenment. And it's, it's, you know, this hits particularly home to me because I lived in Tulsa for, you know, five and a half, six years. I attended Oral Roberts University. Uh, I, because of that, I am part of the legacy. Hi, Robert. <laughs> I'm part of the legacy. And my pastor for five and a half years was Bishop Pearson's um, former assistant pastor who is portrayed in this movie. And so, yeah, go watch the movie. I'm going to give it a thumbs down, too. And people were mad at me because they're saying, you know, oh, you're watching a movie. No, I didn't say if you watch the movie, you're not a Christian. I said if you support the movie. If you are applauding this movie, if you are applauding an angel of light, a minister of light, so to speak, coming down and deceiving this mighty man of God who is in turn deceiving the masses, you are not saved or you're real immature and you need to grow up. Again, when you are immature in your faith, you're the same as a tear. A weed is the same as a tear as long as it's immature. It's when they grow up. We can see that in the parable. It's when the wheat and the tares grow up to a certain point of maturation that we can see, okay, that's a tear. And that is a believer. We need to grow up. Even Paul said, you don't know the difference between a slave and a son. You know, while the son is young, the son has to grow up. He has. Yes, it's very sad. I haven't watched it yet, Robert. And it's great to see um, excited for what you guys are doing. Um, and he he doesn't want, I don't know if you're telling me to repent or telling someone else to repent, Tanetta. <laughs> he wants people to repent. He wants people to repent. He does not want people led astray. And, and one thing I've seen in common um, with a lot of people who are applying effort is, oh, Oh, his compassion. Oh, my goodness. He loves people so much. Mm -mm. Nope. And I'm not saying that he doesn't love them. What I am saying is that the love has been perverted. The truth has been perverted. It's not truth. Per perversion, spiritual perversion is not just about sex. It's not about sexual orientation and how you identify and what you identify as and who you decide to sleep with. That is one section of spiritual perversion. It is one section of spiritual seduction. It encompasses that. Um, okay, thank you for clarifying, Zanetta. <laughs> but um, it encompasses those things, but it is not those things in and of itself. And so we are applauding these things when God wants these people to be saved. He wants you to walk in truth. You know, he told Balaam, you're worse. Balaam wasn't sleeping around, as far as we know. Balaam wasn't doing nothing crazy. Balaam was identified as a prophet of God. He spoke to God. We don't see no wait time. Balaam asked the question. That answer. That is quick. I don't get it like that. <laughs> but the angel of the Lord said, your way is perverse. It's perverse because he was not walking in truth. And I'm not saying that Bishop Pearson is a Balaam, but that was just an example. That it, and just look at the Proverbs. Read the Psalms and the Proverbs. See what the psalmist had to say. See what his son had to say. Perversion is all up and through our pulpits. And a lot of it happens, and I believe this is what happened as well from, from everything I've heard. And again, when you live in Tulsa, you know, you see these people, you interact with these people, you hear the stories. You know, there are a lot of people who used to be at that church. I went to ORU, oh, Jesus, <laughs> fall 2004. 
uh, went to their, uh, what do they call it? College weekend, uh, the spring, spring 2004. And so that's right when all that stuff was hitting Charisma Magazine and all that foolishness and craziness was really starting to hit the fan and people were leaving the church and all that, you know? And, and so I was there right in the midst of it. To Tulsa right in the midst of it. And it's sad. And, and, and what well, I heard Dr. Mike, Brown say or put this in his book um, can you be he said something to the effect of we are viewing or people view the word of God through the lens of their experience and instead of viewing their experience through the lens of God that's where we get in trouble you have to take that away from just homosexuality although that certainly happens there People do it every day. They do it when a loved one dies in, in a tragic accident or from a, you know, a fatal disease. You know, it happens all the time. And so because people don't understand why something happened, we're finite. We're not going to understand everything. But because people don't understand what happened or, you know, whatever the case, they don't understand. And so they try to take the, the word of God and just shove it into something that they do understand. Um, it's like that game. You know, those of you who have kids and remember when you were kids, the game where you have the little shapes and the, and the, the little shape toys and you have the little wooden stand or whatever with the little shapes. And it's like someone trying to take a triangle and shoving it into the circle hole. Now, we expect that from a baby, but we don't expect that from people who identify as believers who've been this thing for 10, 20 years but at the same time your natural age is not in the least determine your spiritual age how old you are you can be 50 60 70 80 years old and be a five-year-old in the spirit it's not fun but it's true and people because you're older and well they've been around for a long time you know we need to honor them no <laughs> the kingdom of god is a meritocracy you know maybe not the church but the that is. And so we have to earn things. Even when you're called, and this is something else I teach my students, a calling is not an ordination. <laughs> now you can have a calling and an ordination that are somewhat close together, but that rarely happens in scripture. I can't think of one time that happened in scripture unless you're Jesus. And even Jesus had to wait. <laughs> he was called from before the foundations of the womb, but he still had to wait 30 years to go in the ministry. And, and so we we try to put these false this, these processes that mean nothing in the spirit because there are traditions, but the people have not they haven't earned they haven't what it is we're trying to put on them, and that's why I think we're confused with a lot of our leaders because we see someone who's gifted and we see someone who's talented and oh your gift will make room for you that's great. But and doing drugs and doing all this craziness and sleeping with your armor bearers. Yes, I said it. If you're doing all this foolishness or whatever it is, if you steal in the church money and uh, manipulating people prophecies to give to you and sleep with you and God knows what else, uh, you do not deserve the ordination. I don't care what you were called to do. You have not merited the ordination. And we... <laughs> Because we haven't dealt with this in the church, now the people who were once sitting on the pews who were spiritually immature have become the leaders who are standing in the pulpit who are still spiritual. And now they have pride because we gave them a title. Jesus! <laughs> Again, I feel like, Paul, who has bewitched you? Who has bewitched you? He said that to the Galatians in, in Galatians 3. Uh, who has bewitched you? And I feel like we really need to ask that question. That is a very specific question to this whole Carlton Pearson business. Because when I tell you I get a headache trying to read his stuff, like it's, it's not, not because I can't read it, but it's like if you don't know your word, if you are not rooted and grounded in, in the truth, and the truth is a person and his name is Jesus. The spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, does not testify of you or me or Johnny or Susie or your favorite preacher. It didn't even testify of Jesus on earth. It testifies of it itself. It, it, it will, what's the word? Um, 
It will back itself. Truth is on the side of truth. The spirit of truth doesn't come for a personality. It doesn't come for a person. It comes for itself because it's coming on the Father's bidding. And so it, whatever it does, whatever it backs, has to be in alignment with the Spirit of God, with, with God the Father who is seated on the throne. Jesus said, I only do what my Father in heaven does. And then when he left, he said, I'm sending the Spirit to you in my stead. And so <laughs> the Spirit of truth is not going to back up a lie. The Spirit of truth is not going to back up an angel of light that already fell thousands or however you however think the earth is and whatever he, it's not going to back up a lie it's not going to back up deception and this is why as i said before at the beginning we need the word and, and spirit because something can feel if you're just soft something can feel right something can even sound right and this is the issue i have a lot of times and y'all saw me post earlier um, probably on twitter you know being prophetic is a burden because you see See things, you pick up things, things, however it is you receive things from the spirit, you you know what is happening or what is there, what is operating behind the scenes in the spirit. And so even if it looks good, if it looks right, if it's you know, if it looks like a duck and walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, you know it's a goose. <laughs> because the spirit of the Lord shows. And people will tell you you're crazy. They'll tell you you're judgmental. They will call you every name in the book. You ain't saved. You making Christians look bad. I know because people will have inbox of these things <laughs> or just send them blatantly. It is what it is. People don't know because they can't see. It. And I have to remind myself, okay, they can't see it. They don't have eyes to see and ears to hear. But one thing y'all know I say, error appears in the pulpit last so when bishop pearson or whomever up in the pulpit and starts preaching a false gospel how long was that working how long was that in the background behind the scenes how long had he been entertaining that angel of light how long and if you are operating in a spirit of uh, discerning and discern, discernment, um, the, the gift and discerning of spirits, you know, this, discernment just period is, is more a type of wisdom. And there's this discerning of spirits where you literally pick up on spirits and that is a spiritual gift. They're not the same thing. Um, but when you're operating in the discerning of spirits and you pick up on a thing, like you'll know even if everything sounds right, it's still off. How, how do I know this? What is it, Acts 16? where Paul was confronted um, by the slave girl with the spirit of divination, which she said was accurate, but his gut, his spirit was agitated. And so he was able to pick up, okay, this is not the spirit of God. This is in fact the spirit of divination. This is not of God. He cast the spirit out of her and he got put in jail <laughs> because he did accurately because he perceived that what she's saying may be right. Right, but the spirit and the motive behind her saying it is of the devil. Our discernment, there's so many people who are talking about, well, I don't need discernment. Are you crazy? In this day and age, with, with, with package bombs and, and, and bombs dropping and crazy racist people and kids shooting up schools and all this crazy, you don't need discernment? Okay. Fun play your life <laughs> you know we need discernment we need uh the discerning of spirits and you ask for these things if you need wisdom james says if any man lacks wisdom let him ask of god who gives liberally and without reproach so god is like hey i want to give this if you want the gift of discerning of spirits ask god for the gift because he wants to give that to you we're supposed to be gentle as does, but wise as serpents. That's about the only place, the, one of two places I can think of in Scripture where serpents are seen in a good light. Because, you know, they can perceive things. Uh, even in the ancient world and in mythology and all that, whatever. Serpents represent wisdom. So this is the one time. <laughs> the one time outside of, you know, the bronze serpent in the Old Testament where serpents are a, a good symbolism. We need sharp. King discernment in the spirit 
We need to be able to say, okay, I don't know what it is. And, and a lot of us, you know, I know what that's like, where you literally don't know what it is, but you know it's something. You can feel it it in the gut. Why do you feel it in your gut? Because out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. It's, I mean, and obviously the Holy Spirit doesn't just pick one spot. Obviously, he should be all in and through you, but speaking, that is where the rivers, not just one, rivers of living water flow from. So when your gut, you know, you know, is off, follow your gut. There, I cannot listen to them. Because my stomach, well, like, call the Pepto-Bismol. I need Need something for my stomach and I'm not trying to gross y'all out but my stomach gets so agitated at the sound of a voice because the spirit is off and these are people that people love they oh that's the great apostle that's the great prophet that's the great whatever they have a spirit I don't care how anointed they are and in fact I will confirm I will come into agreement with the fact that they are anointed of God but the spirit is perverse the way is perverse something got in the Pick somewhere and don't like pick on people. And I'm trying to pick on people because it is the work of the devil to come in and deceive God's elect. So he targets the anointed. He targets those with the high call. This is something God began showing me uh, several years ago. He, it's not just certain people he'll, he'll target. It's not just the prophets. It's not just the apostles. He targets people with a high call. Leave Susie down the street. I mean, fine. You know, that's not a good thing. And he'll have one Susie and, you know, the people connected to Susie. But if he deceives someone with a pulpit, he deceives a lot. He can, he can um, administer that deception on a much wider scale it's the same thing with salvation people will be like well salvation is equal okay your salvation is just as important personally speaking as a famous person's salvation um but your reach is not their reach my reach is not some of my favorite minister's reach i got five people on here right now <laughs> so, you know if he can deceive somebody with mass following he can control the masses this is something I, I i like to teach and write on you know principality not like we don't unless you're like judas or the antichrist or like queen jezebel or ahab or somebody like like major in scripture we don't see you possessed by a prince we don't see angelic fallen princes principalities coming and possessing these is people, unless it is more strategic for them in the long run to sort of restrict themselves because the person in that position, the strong man, the, the earthly strong man they've chosen, can give them access to structures in media, airwaves, and radio waves. That's what he's like, okay, this is a great decision. Let me, let me, as the spirit of Jezebel, come and possess this person. Let me, as I don't know, Ahab. Let me come in Antichrist, come and possess this person because it is more beneficial for me to do that. And so, at the same time, it's it's more beneficial for God to, for for a a well known person to be saved and processed. We're not negating anything we're talking about before here, and because if somebody gets for real, for real, for real, for real and for real for real discipled and for real for real walks and lives in holiness and in and he here's to this that's going to make a difference that's going to make a massive difference and so again we need to go back to striving to being that standard we need to pick a side the world and do you want the benefits of being in the world oh hey guess what this is the same thing Jesus Jesus had to do. Um, one of my top blog posts for this is probably the third year now. Can you really sell your soul to the devil? And is there a way out? Something like that. Um, can you, you would be shocked by the emails I get from people, y'all. Um, still, but Jesus. You know, again, if I'm going to say something to you, there's a basis for the scripture. Jesus was approached by the ruler of this world, as he called him, by the power of the air. 
who said, I will give you the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus didn't contradict him. He didn't contradict him. He said, I will give you the kingdoms of the world if you would bow down and worship me. And Jesus was like, no, I'm good. Jesus already knew that the kingdoms of this world would be, become the kingdoms of our Lord and of our Christ, according to the book of Revelation. He knew the word. He was the word embodied. He was Emmanuel. <laughs> so he, he understood all of that. And so he was not, a, he did not enable himself to be deceived, no matter how hungry he was, <laughs> you know? And so we, if, if the son of God <laughs> was able to be offered that same temptation, you know, and put it on a proportional level. What makes you think, you think I'm any different? And trust me, I've had these temptations come, like insane, crazy stuff, like crazy. <laughs> you know, these spirits are not playing. They come to deceive the masses. And when we do not know our word, when we do not have a solid, growing, maturing relationship, we're doing the enemy's work for him. And I know I talk about the enemy on my blog. I deal a lot with um, demonic spirits and spiritual warfare and things like that. Um, just try to push is that, hey, we already have the victory. Hey, like to, to, to put things in perspective, um, because it is a perspective. Deliverance is a balance. It's a balance. There are people who say, well, I don't like deliverance because we're all about personal responsibility and don't like deliverance. Like, it's, it's a hot mess. We need both. You needed, if you would have took some personal responsibility in a lot of cases, you would have been in a position to where you needed deliverance. And guess what? You still have to want to be delivered. That's why you should mess with people who don't want to be delivered. Just pray for them and keep it going. <laughs> They'll come to you if they want deliverance. You know, and when you oper when you get delivered whatever that process looks like for you then you have to walk in that you have to resume your personal responsibility so we need to implement personal responsibility in our lives as believers do you know do, do you at least have an idea i'm not asking you for specific quotations you know can you paraphrase the scripture <laughs> do you know what jesus said do you know what does not look like jesus when you're looking for counterfeits when you're studying how to recognize counterfeits you don't study counterfeits you study the authentic and so we have a lot of people who are studying the counterfeits spiritually and then trying to determine what is and is not of god but you haven't studied the word of god you haven't studied the authentic to be able to know okay this is god this is not Try the spirits to see if they be of God. What does that mean? It means to weigh them, to examine them, to test them, weigh them out. You know, see, okay, is this, you know, right? You know, if you, um, if you take a gold earring, you know, let's say this one, it, this obviously is not real gold. <laughs> um, and then if this one is gold, guess which one's probably going to weigh heavier? Probably the one that's real gold, right? And so there are ways that you can test things, you know, so if you know what scripture says, then you know, okay, so if this is what Jesus said, and if this is what the prophet said, and this is what the apostle said in the epistles and different things like, as a, again, God is never going to leave himself without a witness out of the words of two or three witnesses, every word is established, you know, and so is there a basis for this in scripture? Bishop Pearson is around preaching that there's no hell. Did Jesus preach that there was no hell? Jesus taught more in hell than he taught on heaven. Because he didn't want us to go there. And guess what? He said if anyone offends these little ones, leads them astray, it would be better that you put a millstone around your neck and cast yourself into the sea. We know, I'm not trying to go into rabbit trouble, we know suicide is a sin. You can repent if you kill somebody. I'm not giving you a pass to go out and kill people. But you can repent if you kill somebody. But unless there's like a moment between like trying to commit suicide and actually dying, I don't see where, I mean, that's like the only space of time, and it's a short one, where you can repent. You know, but he's saying, hey, it's better if you do that than if you continue to lead my little ones astray. 
because God doesn't play, and he's not just talking about children. It, it certainly includes children, but he's talking about the ones who are younger in their faith, the ones who are not fully established, the ones who are maybe new and haven't had a chance, haven't had a chance to be able to really get this whole thing down. This is why, you know, being in a church that actually preaches the word and demonstrates it is important because we have to be rooted and grounded. We have to be in a place where we're growing. Whatever your speed is, you should be growing. And you don't have to compare yourself to somebody else because you should be comparing to the plan and will of God for your life, to the appointed timing of God for your life. Not to anybody else's. Because your plumb line is not my plumb line when it comes to the purpose of God personally, individually, for my life. So you should be advancing, though, at some point, because if you're not advancing, there's no such thing as moving, or standing still in the spirit. You can't just sit down and pop a squat. <laughs> you're either moving forward or you're moving backward. And we need to be at least moving forward at some, you know, point. Just, you know, don't try and tackle reading the Bible in one year. <laughs> if you're brand new, you know, get, get a reading plan that maybe maybe, you know, stretches it out a little bit more. Maybe you just need to focus on one verse a day. I don't, if you're starting it, whatever that looks like for you. You know, maybe don't try to, like, overshoot things because then you may get, like, depressed and just discouraged and the enemy can come in with condemnation, which is illegal if you're a son of God, if you're a child of God, but he'll do it anyway because he operates completely illegally in our lives. And we need to be moving forward. And we need to be around people that we can say, hey, is this right? I heard so-and-so say, this is true. I have a guy that does that to me all the time, bless his heart. <laughs> you know, is this true? We need to have people we can ask who know the word of God, who can tell us, okay, this is true, this is not true. This is what the Bible says. And not just tell us, but like really show us in scripture, this is what is accurate. This is what is right. This is what Jesus meant. This is the context. Because again, context is everything. This is the context of what is being said here because a lot of people will start a false doctrine off of one verse or one paragraph that they don't understand and don't know the context of. And you can't just ignore like a whole testament. <laughs> you can't ignore the Old Testament because we're under grace. No, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. They both testify of each other. Jesus is in the old as well as the new. So you can't just focus on the red letters, even though the red letters are absolutely important. You can't forsake the epistles for the sake of the red letters. You can't forsake the Old Testament for the sake of the new because there are a lot of things that will confirm each other. Like, I mean, just for like a random fact, like you don't know the names of the magicians that Moses fought against in the Old Testament, but it shows you in the New Testament, <laughs> there are a lot of things that will pop up or that will be made clearer to you when you understand the fullness in the context of Jesus did not come to abolish or destroy the law. He came to fulfill the law. There is a distinct difference. And so we need to understand what our foundation is. We need to understand, you know, what our, what our non goals are, you know, and this isn't about harping on what you wear or what you listen to, or, you know, the Holy Spirit is great for leading you in those things, <laughs> you know, assuming that you have a relationship with Praise the Lord. Um, but like, what are the tenets of our faith? Is there a Trinity? Is Jesus God? You know, different things like that. What does the word actually say about salvation? What does the word say about the Holy Spirit and the demonstration and the interactions with the Holy Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit God? Yes. Is God upset if we worship the Holy Spirit? No, because he is God. You know, different things like that that may seem ridiculous to you that you may take for granted if you're spiritually mature, but these are things that could actually trip up someone who's younger. I know because people ask me these questions. You know, some of them as recently as yesterday. And so we need to be moving forward and we need to be able to be familiar with the Spirit of God, if you've read my book, Judging the Prophetic, um, I sort of changed it around the format recently, but once you actually get to the chapters, before I talk about prophecy, before I show you about familiar, familiarity, all that, no, we talk about the Holy Spirit. Because how does the Holy Spirit operate? What is the nature of the Holy Spirit? Because if you don't know the nature, nature of the Holy Spirit, how are you going to know the difference between the Holy Spirit and an unholy spirit? You know, if you don't know what the fruit of the Spirit is, how are you, you might be tripped up, 
you know, by the gifting of someone who is not displaying the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And we are supposed to be fruit inspectors. And this is where one of my passages comes in. And this is Matthew 3. And this is so important, Matthew 3, 7 through 12. But when he saw many of the Pharisees, he being um, John the Baptist, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to vipers, who warned you to flee the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruit worthy of repentance. And do not think and say to yourself, for I say to you that God is able to raise up children from Abraham or to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. There every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut and uh, cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water into repentance, but he who was coming after I who sandals I'm not worthy to carry, and he will baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. Fire. Uh, his winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. There, you see that gathering barn again. It, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. You know, if we don't pick a side, God is going to pick for us. And it doesn't mean he puts you in hell. He doesn't want you to be in hell, but it's already determined. Go back to John 3. Uh, 3, 16 through 21, I believe uh, what I read was um, the world is already condemned. So he's like, I don't have to come condemning the world because it's already condemned. I love you. I died for you. And I hope that you cross over into the place where you are no longer condemned. But until that point happens, you remain condemned. I don't have to condemn you. That's the enemy's work. He He's able to condemn those who belong to him. Because they belong to him. But Jesus is like, hey, I am offering something much better. But there's a standard that goes with it. People want the benefits, but they don't want the responsibilities. And so we need to really be aware of what those things are so we can discern what is and is not of God. <laughs> um, we just have so much craziness from Snoop's gospel album, to the Come Sunday film with Bishop Pearson, to, to everyday occurrences in our pulpits, to Christians running around quoting Brene Brown and Marion Williamson. Y'all are quoting some New Age witches. And we, we, don't, we don't discern the spirit, and we don't discern who is saying what and where it's coming from and why they're saying it. And it's just, we're, we're losing our foundation. Our foundation is crumbling and nobody's like, Hey, maybe we need to repair it because there's like a massive crack in the ground because they're comfortable and they don't want to do any. Like being in God is not easy. It's a war. <laughs> we win if we're on the right side, but we have to pick the winning side and you know, and we just have a lot of these false theologies that are floating around, you know, and it comes in little phrases like, oh, we're all God's children. No, we're not. And that's not like an arrogance thing or a self-righteous thing. Only those, according to the word of God, born of the spirit are those who are sons of God. What is it? John 12 or 1, 12 through 13, 14, something like that. Um, only those born of the spirit are the sons of God. We be born of the spirit of God in order to become a son of God. What does that mean? Uh, it doesn't mean obviously we're becoming Jesus, but a son of God in the context um, of like an angel, it means it's a direct creation of God. Um, like we don't replicate other Christians. We should disciple other Christians, but like if you're a Christian and you marry a Christian, y'all have a baby, your baby's not automatically a Christian. <laughs> we are not all children and God has no grandchildren, grandbabies, he doesn't have nieces, God children. <laughs> like he has sons and that's just the pluralistic term, sons and daughters, children, that's it. And then he has creations which is everybody and then he has children which are the sons and daughters of, of god who have been born of the spirit of god and there are a whole lot of people who don't understand the difference and we just really need to bring back maturity so i mean if like desiree is crazy i've given you several scriptures to this point <laughs> you know and um if you're late and you want to hear some of the scriptures i came from galatians 1 6 through 10 
16 through 21. Matthew 3, 7 through 12, which is what I just recently read, the parable of tares, and I'll just say Matthew 13 because there's one paragraph with the parable and then another paragraph with the interpretation. And there's another one that I haven't read yet. But you know, there, there's scripture for this. I'm not just talking off the top of my head. There is scripture for this. We are not to be deceived. And whenever you look at Jesus, whenever you look at the apostles, the harshest rebukes, they're not to the world. They're to the believers. They're to the people who say, I'm a believer. I'm saved. I'm this. I'm that. But are you? Like, really, are you? If nothing about you looks like you are saved, genuinely and authentically begs the question, are you indeed saved? Hi to all the people who are joining now. Hi, Charlie and Stephanie and Josh and everybody. Um, you, you really have to check yourself. And it's not about some, someone coming down on you. And I'm probably going to get some hate mail because of this. You know, whatever. <laughs> you know, it's about what the word of God says. And people will get so mad at you for sharing what the word of God says. But I'm like, if Jesus said it, if Jesus, if Jesus keeps talking about, you know, his being separated and put into a barn for safekeeping and then the rest of them being thrown into the fire, what do you think that's a parable for? What do you think that's a metaphor for? You know, and so hell is real. It's not a state of mind. It's not non-existent. It's not nothingness. It's eternal separation from God. And we, by default, opt to go to hell if we do not choose God. And some people will be like, well, I love God, but, you know, holiness is legalism. The devil is a liar. Now, holiness is not wearing your hair in a bun and wearing a long skirt and just some traditional idea. Spiritual protocol is not the same thing as the traditions of man. And as the Bible says, a lot of times the traditions of man make the word of God of no effect. Or we make the God, word of God of no effect through the traditions of man. You know, and, and we just, we have a lot of traditions that have nothing to, to do with spiritual truth. Or maybe we're, we're based upon a spiritual truth but have become so warped and twisted and perverse over time that it no longer resembles discussed before, the spirit of truth only testifies of himself. He does not testify of you or me or of anyone else, not even Jesus the man he testifies of himself because he sent on behalf of the father and he sent to be a witness to the father and so we have to just truth and there is not a, there's no such thing as your truth and my truth and our truth and no and i saw somebody put that mess on facebook today about bishop pearson's movie and you know i'm so proud for sharing his truth he's going to hell if he does not repent and please recant, he is going to hell. I do not want him to go to, to hell. I don't want his beautiful babies or his you know, ex-wife or whatever or anybody to go to hell. God does not want anyone. I'm sorry if my sound is going out in and out. I don't know what's happening. does not want anyone to go to hell. He loves us. He sent his son to die for us. And Jesus very clearly told us, no man takes my life. I'm giving it. I'm laying it down by my choice. That is not a God who's sitting on a throne eagerly waiting to throw you into a flaming pit of fire. He loves us. But God is not going to break his own word. God is not Adam. He's not Adam. He's not like, oh, well, she ate the fruit. Let me just pass it over, babe. Okay, let me eat it. No. <laughs> and, and we have this false idea of love where, well, I love them, so I don't want their feelings. You think that when they are lifting up their eyes in hell, like the rich man in the parable from the Gospels, that they are not going to be mad at you for not telling them the truth that's not love that's like an extremely shallow if you're ignorant god recognizes your ignorance and works with your ignorance you know the bible says he winks 
he winks at our ignorance, you know? And so I believe there's a time and a place for that. But now that you know, we are held responsible for what we know. So unless you get amnesia or something, like you are responsible for what you know. And so we have to share that with others. It doesn't mean Westboro Baptist, God hates fags. The devil devil is a liar. That's trash too. That's condemnation. That's not the spirit of God. That is not Christianity. That's not Christianity. These people who go into these temples and uh, Sheik temples and Islamic temples and whatever temples and shoot at people, that's not Christianity. That's like a very literal murderous form of condemnation. Like you are not their judge in that regard. And at the same time, me telling you the truth is not me being judgmental. It's telling you the truth. It's already judged. Sin is already judged. False gospel are already judged. False teachers, false prophets are going to come in my name. It's not Jesus. It's another Jesus. It's a changeling. If you don't know what a changeling is, Google it. And I'm not talking about the movie. It's a changeling. Something has been swapped out. You know, what a changeling is, I'm Irish, so I know these things. I like studying uh, Celtic history. A changeling is where the fairies sneak in and take the baby and switch out your natural human baby for a fairy baby and take the human baby off to fairyland, you know, and then leave the um, uh, uh, fairy baby in their place. Obviously, this is not real, uh, but this is this is the legend or myth, if you will, of a changeling. So this is what people have done to Jesus. They have swapped out the real Jesus for a false one of their own imagining. You know, um, I forget who it was. I don't know if it was Voltaire or somebody associated with the French Revolution talking. Well, no, I'm just mixing up all of my quotes, so don't quote me on who quoted this. <laughs> but talking about how we make gods in our image. We do not make God. And that because unknowingly we do try to force him into our image. No, boo-boo. We were made in his image. So we're supposed to conform to the image of God. But the problem in the church is that we have a whole lot of people who are interested in conforming into the image of God. We don't have a lot of fathers and a lot of mothers who are travailing until Christ be born in their spiritual children because they just want to gain a lot of spiritual children so they look famous and wonderful and successful and say, oh, look what I did. That is not <laughs> the heart of the Father in the least. And, and a lot of people are making Jesus Christ into this changeling Jesus, the Jesus of Mormonism, the Jesus of the New Age, the Jesus of Islam and the nation of Islam, the Jesus of all these other religions. That is not Jesus. You might have a side and a component of Jesus, but one sliver of Jesus is not Jesus. It's not Jesus. It's another Jesus. And if Jesus himself had to come and warn against false Christ and false teachers, we know anything his father didn't say. Would that we were like that. So um, um, I think that's all. I, I do want to leave you with this verse. Hopefully we'll get me fired up again. <laughs> um, but this is 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. And he's, um, this is, of course, an epistle to his Paul's spiritual son, Timothy. And he's saying, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge, let me say that word again, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearance, appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. It doesn't say preach your feelings. It doesn't say preach nice anecdotes and warm, fuzzy stories. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke. Exhort. What does exhort mean? Exhorting, uh, it's an encouragement toward doing good. So I encourage you to work out if you need to work out. I encourage you to read your Bible. I encourage you to pray in tongues. I encourage you to live holy because holiness is still right. So it's an encouragement to do right. Okay. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching for the time will 
come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires. According to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you, you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So what is it saying? What is, what is verse 3 and 4 saying here? What is Paul saying with Timothy? He's saying, okay, there's going to come a time in his day, in our day, we know what's here in our day. We've been discussing it in this live, you know, where people... They don't, they don't want to hear it. He literally said they will not endure it. They can't handle it. They don't want to hear it. They'll walk out on it. They'll give you a lawsuit because of it. Whatever that looks like, they will not endure sound doctrine, meaning they will not endure the truth of God's word. They'll make up all sorts of craziness. I'm adding now. <laughs> They'll likely make up all sorts of craziness. They'll slander you, because that's the work of Jezebel. They will slander you. Satan um, means the accuser. He's the accuser of the brethren. They will attack you. They may fit. They do physically attack people and kill people in other countries. You can go to jail for this stuff now in Canada. You know what I mean? Kim Davis went to jail just a few years ago in America. You know, um, they do not want to hear the truth. Why? Because of what's already in their heart. Your heart is a seat or capital, if you will, or throne, so to speak, of your mind, will, and emotions. So because of their own desires because of their own wicked evil desires what did we say in john 3 uh the world is already condemned because they don't want to be in the light because the light's going to expose their deeds they love darkness because their deeds are evil their desires are evil and they have itching ears does that mean they want to hear what they want to hear so if you tell them what they don't want to hear then they'll hear you but they will heed you that's why, why do you think these psychic lines <laughs> you know, are so jam-packed and so expensive because they're hearing what they want to hear. You know, a lot of these people in pulpits are acting like psychics. Moving on. Um, they do not want to hear the truth. They have itching ears. And so they're teachers. They're going to heap up to themselves teachers who are going to say exactly what they want to hear. Now, I have a story about this. Some of you guys have read my blog post um, about my um, being attacked by witches <laughs> back in 2013, 13 and 14. It was 2014. And um, it, it got really hairy and really crazy. Obviously, nothing happened to me. I'm fine. But um, it was a very intense uh, period of spiritual warfare. And there was a young man and, um, who had accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, but he had, had not gone through deliverance. So there were several doors in his life that were still open that was allowing him to be a tool of the enemy it's his heart and and so he was open to this spiritual deception of oneness and um to dreams that i believe were sent um by the switch if not by the spirits behind the switch who were trying to like and this is just ridiculous to me but trying to invite me to, to be a false teacher like y'all thought i was playing before when i said that i been tempted in this part in this department like this is legit they wanted me to travel the world with this young man who is gay mind you marry this young man and travel the world with this young man preaching false gospels they wanted to set me up as a jezebel like a literal jezebel revelation 220 that woman jezebel who calls herself a prophetess that's what they wanted me to be there are a lot of people who, maybe not to that extreme, that's a very extreme story, but there are a lot of people who will take the bait because it will keep their lights on, because it will give them a paycheck, because they can pay their staff, because they can keep, you know, the AC or the heat on, because it will keep their pews full, because it will give them 
a claim in a name in a, in a, a reputation will get them on TV and all of these things and it will get people giving them ten million dollar offerings and all of this foolishness which I mean, I'm not saying a ten million dollar offering is foolishness I'm really not <laughs> but they will tailor what they say to the people's feelings because it's what they want to hear and it, it it has to start small like you don't get a believer by just walking up in a devil mask and a pitchfork you know and saying i'm the devil please follow me <laughs> like, that's not how it works it starts small it starts very very small um and we see that in scripture there's always a scriptural basis for everything we have to teach you know and so we see it in the garden of eden did god really for some of you that may look like well what did he really mean when he said well yeah he said that for them in the old testament or he said that for them 2000 years ago but did he really mean for you to do that for you to live that way it might start small hey you don't have to pay your tithes you know, that's, that's an Old Testament. We're under grace. We don't need to pay our tithes. <laughs> we, we don't have to go to church or we don't have to be fed. We don't have to read the word. We don't, it's going to start small, whatever that looks like. Again, we're drawn away by our own lust. Paul told Timothy it was by their own desires. So whatever that looks like, it's going to start small and build up. Um, Apostle Brian Meadows has an excellent teaching. I'm, if you ask my students, I'm always recommending it to them. <laughs> it's called Be Open, um, and it's on YouTube. Just look it up. Please look it up. Share it. It's phenomenal. And it talks about um, how principalities work and strongmen um, in, in regions work and how the principality over a region will choose a strong man. Who is a strong man in the context of humans? It's, it's a well-known person, a well-known minister, or whatever. Someone who's strong in some capacity. Um, and will choose them and will start influencing and seducing them. And just little tweaks here and there, you know, until next thing you have a false preacher who is is preaching false doctrines you know what did I tell you guys earlier error appears in the pulpit last so if I get up in the pulpit on Sunday and start preaching false doctrines it's because for at the bare minimum I would say months but really and truly years for years I have done exactly what scripture told me not to do which is casting down every imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. But instead of casting it down, I've entertained it. And I've nurtured it. And I've nursed it. And it's become a part of my belief system to the point conversations. It comes out backstage. It comes out over the phone. It, it shows in some of my affiliations. And my affiliations begin to reflect me instead of me reflecting on them and influencing them to godliness. And, and you begin to be like, yeah, I'm okay with this. I'm cool with this. Yeah, in, my, in my recent post from yesterday, the day before, about compromise, uh, uh, compassion, not compromise, you know, I talk about Jesus. And Jesus loved people, but he did not come down to their level. And what do I mean? I'm not talking about he didn't speak in a way that they couldn't understand because he definitely did that. Can't see why this is right. Okay, so I'm not going to make this a requirement for you. The Bible says, I'm the Lord, I change not. Jesus is Lord. <laughs> he is God. He doesn't change. And so his, his, his word does not change depending on what we can and cannot stomach. His word is not going to change because we don't want to endure sound doctrine. His word is not going to change because it hurts our feelings. And this feelings devil, <laughs> it's not a devil. I'm old school, so I call it a devil. But this feelings devil is taking entire nations in its thrall by the feelings of small minorities. I'm not trying to go off on a tangent about the LGBTQ team community, but we are being controlled by emotions. 
well, well, if you say, okay, well, then if something I can say to you makes you want to commit suicide, then you have a problem. And you need to be delivered. Because I can say the ugliest, nastiest, meanest thing to you, but they're words. And I understand words are weapons and all that. We talked about that earlier. But you still have a choice. And if you are a believer, you should choose to cast down those words. If you don't like those words, do what you do to all those other people and just tell them. You don't want to hear them and tell them to shut up. But you shouldn't want to go kill yourself because someone said something you don't like. You shouldn't immediately go and put a lawsuit against someone because they're preaching something that they don't like. And people are using feelings to push legislation. To push legislation, y'all. And it's a crying shame. Which has lost our influence. Since we've only cared about our four and no more, we've abandoned the seven mountains of influence and let the whore of Babylon sit on them. <laughs> you know, we, we're losing our influence. And so we just sound crazy off in the corner. No one's paying attention to us because we have no spiritual influence. We don't use it because we're like, oh, I don't want to offend anybody. There's a difference between speaking the truth that happens to be offensive and intentionally offending someone. And people think that being a Christian means that you have to say nice things. Look at Jesus. Look at the Baptist who was his herald. He straight up called the Pharisees a brood of vipers. <laughs> Jesus did too, you know. So being saved is not about being nice. There are a lot of things that we're supposed to do that are not considered nice. They're not going to give us warm fuzzies. But we're yet and still called to do those things. And so we can't gauge our spirituality in our what parts of the Bible we do and do not believe based on our feelings because we're meant to be subject to the word of God. Subject first to our own spirits and our spirit is supposed to be subject to the word of God because your spirit or your feelings come from your soul and our flesh are supposed to be in under submission to our spirit man and our spirit man is supposed to be under the lordship of Jesus Christ those things then you have valid questions to ask are you saved because if you're on the fence i can't tell which side like which side do you prefer it's long enough you're gonna fall and it's probably not gonna be on the right side and so we need to see a restoration of holiness what do i mean by holiness of sanctification um set apart for God. And it doesn't mean you don't go to the movies or you never listen to secular music. You know, there are convictions and there are doctrines. So if you, I, I firmly believe this is my conviction. <laughs> if you um, have a conviction from the Holy Spirit and then you feel that conviction, it is a sin for you. But you can't go in the pulpit and start preaching convictions as a doctrine. Because doctrine is not conviction. And we have whole denominations set up on convictions and not doctrine. It should be the other way around. And, um, I mean, I'm not trying to promote denomination, denominationalism, but you get the idea. We need to be in the spirit of truth. We need to be moving towards that. We need to be maturing in the spirit so the world can tell the difference between us and them. We need to stop looking like tares and grow up grow up in the things of God. And like, there's so many benefits. There's so many benefits to being in God. And the world will tell you, you know, find yourself and find love. Where well, you're going to find those when you're in God, because he'll put you where you need to be. And, and you will find your true self, your truest self, as the world likes to say, in him. And it'll also put you in, in, in place in terms of arrogance, because you realize the more you discover, the less you know. But still, it makes you hungry for more. And so if you are hungry, if you are thirsty, you're in the right direction. You know, he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. When you put first the kingdom of God, all these other things, 
all these other things that are added. Fill in the blank as to what those things are. You know, and when our desires, only when our desires align with his desires, can we begin to put some sort of merit in them. Otherwise, you're stuck in what Jeremiah was saying, and the heart is wicked and deceitful above all things who can know it. You know, we have to look like God. And, and again, I'm not harping on appearance or things like that, but those things, if you are in place, those things should also, and I'm not, I'm not even going to go off on that because it's not even about that. And at the end of the day, if someone telling you your dress is too tight or your dress is too short or your pants is too tight, brothers, you know, and your equipment is showing and outlined and all that, like, and you're offended by that, <laughs> grow up. Grow up. Because even if you're not there, that's why God has, you know, the, the older women teaching the younger women. And that's why, you know, we're supposed to have mothers and fathers in this. And that's why we're supposed to have teachers, and there's supposed to be a lot of teachers, and that's also why the teachers are held to a higher standard. <laughs> you know, they're there for a reason. God puts godly authorities and leaders in place. You know, we see godly leadership positions created, and that's not to say just follow someone who has a title. Please don't just follow someone because they have a title. Jesus, please don't do that. <laughs> but follow people who are following God. Follow people who are being transformed into the image of God and will travail until you be formed into the image of God. Um, and we'll see a change. We'll see an awesome change. And the world's going to say, okay, what's different? Even if they can't stand you, <laughs> even if they can't stand you, you're going to see the difference. You're going to see the difference. And uh, this is a whole other topic for a whole other day. I'm not going to really go there tonight. You know, once we start getting and this is all of us, me included, once we start getting our money right and having some economic power, the world will literally hate us, but they will absolutely bow the knee <laughs> because the Canaanites wanted Abraham around because he was a prince. He had money. Joseph, look at the patriarchs. Look at the clout they had. Look at the men in scripture and women. It was women who funded Jesus' ministry. They could call the shots because they had money. I was teaching my class about this. It wasn't even on the, we were talking about the queen of heaven as it relates to socioeconomic influence and that in the word um, of, or in the word of God as it pertains to it. You know, and I, I mentioned President Trump. Like him, hate him, you shouldn't hate him. Repent, <laughs> pray for him. But like him, dislike him, agree with him, disagree with him. The man funded his own campaign. When was the last time an American president did that? It's power and agendas and things like that are being pushed and promoted and listened to. They can buy the airtime and different things like that because they have money. Black America showed up and showed out for Black Panther because they took the money they didn't have to support a movie that was important to them. <laughs> so, and I, I'm just kind of joking there. But you know what I mean? Like, money is power. And so if we start acting like the church from a spiritual perspective, when we start believing every part of the word, that will be evident in every part of our lives. And Deuteronomy 8.18 did indeed say that God has given us the power to get wealth so that he can establish his covenant with us. So even being rich goes back to being a child of God. I'm not saying if you're a child of God, you're going to be rich. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not a prosperity preacher, although I'm certainly not a poverty preacher. Praise the Lord. Who wants to be poor? Not me. <laughs> so, you know, money talks. Money has power. The Bible says that money answers all things. And so we can't just sit and wait here for the sweet by and by and not make a difference. What kind of money do you think it really costs to disciple the world? You know, when you have a revival, Bible, look at Acts 2, and the Lord added to the, to, to the church daily. Oh, 2,000 here, 3,000 here. Where are you going to put them on Sunday morning? Where are you going to put them? Like, where are you going to put them for your crusade? Like, I believe, I believe firmly in Scripture will back me up. That sooner or later, if God said it, he's going to provide for it, but we have to believe him. We can't be like the man um, I heard uh, my bishop, Tudor Bismarck, talk about 
who had the faith of God to raise a man from the dead, y'all. Raised him from the dead, but walked three days to a meeting because he did not have that same faith for a bus fare. We can't have like a schizo Christianity. We can't have a double minded faith. Either we believe the word of God in context <laughs> or we don't. Um, and so, believe that God wants us to mature in every area. Yeah. He wants us to look like Him. And poverty doesn't look like God. It doesn't look like God. And I'm not, Lord knows I ain't rolling the money at this particular point in time. <laughs> Lord knows it knowing because he gives bread to the sower and I know what's starting to take place in my life and I know what he's promised me. And guess what? I can't just sit and wait back on a prophetic word. Well, the Lord said this. Okay, so what am I doing? That's why I started selling paparazzi, <laughs> among other things. You know what I mean? Like, what are you doing to actively grow in that thing God has shown? to mature in that thing to prepare yourself for where he said he was going to take you again this is a totally different topic i'm done um thank you to everyone who listened i am going to try to do more facebook lives probably not this week um but i am going to do more facebook lives i will be doing some paparazzi ones monday nights at 9 p.m eastern standard these will probably be all over the place and because i'm a night owl they will likely be in the evening like this one was i don't know that all of them will be 140 minutes long. Uh, but please like and comment and share. Um, I want to hear from you guys. I want to hear what you thought about this. Um, I'm not going to pander to your itching ears. Ha ha. Okay. Um, but I want to, you know, let me know what you think. Um, is this hitting home to you? Do you have any aha moments? Um, is this in keeping with what the Lord has been speaking to you? Um, and this is me. This is me growing because I've been saying for the longest i need to do a facebook live i need to do it Ugh, i don't want to do it but this is actually kind of fun i kind of not sure how i would like it um so yeah um thank you so much and you all have a wonderful evening and please again um share this share 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 praise the lord y'all have a wonderful night